Hey Rob, looks like you're already recording. Um, Thanks to everyone who's joining. So I'll have a few coming in and welcome to everybody who's already joined. Appreciate you being early and ready. Just a few more moments while we get the rest of our attendees to join. I appreciate your patience. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Ramirez. You'll learn more about me in a short minute, but I'd like to introduce somebody you may already know today, Jay Pepper Martins, head of uh, MLS and IT for San Francisco Association of Realtors. Jay, thanks. why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Sounds good. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Kyle mentioned, uh, I'm Jay, the director of the MLS, and I'm also the IT manager for the association. So um, one of my responsibilities is making sure that our resources are available so that we can help uh, you as our agents. Um, I want to welcome you with a sincere wish that you're all safe and that you're all well. I know it's been a challenging time for many of us as we adapt to these sort of extraordinary circumstances and, and um, adopt some new working patterns. Um, we're super excited to share some stories today um, and talk about some actionable, timely and helpful tips um, that'll help you make the transition to fully remote working and um, help you get your feet wet with some collaboration tools. Some of them you'll have seen, some of them you'll have heard of, some of them might be new um, for improving real-time communication and improving your productivity and efficiency. Um, we're also gonna focus quite a bit today on security and uh, talking about uh, some things you can do to make sure that as you're operating completely remotely, you're doing so in a way that keeps your client's information safe and your information safe and confidential. Um, during the uh, presentation, um, we're gonna get you to scan the bottom of the Zoom window. If you uh, hover your mouse over the Zoom window, you'll see at the bottom, there is a Q&A panel you can click on. And if you click on that panel, you will be able to type in questions. So please feel free to type in questions throughout the presentation. We welcome them and we'll either address them in line or we'll save them up and, uh, and answer some of those questions at the end. And we're also gonna have an open Q&A session at the end too. Um, also, we're gonna do some poll questions during the presentation. So um, when we get to a slide that says there's a poll, uh, you'll get a pop-up in your Zoom window and it's gonna ask you to answer. Most of the questions are answer with a single click uh, to select one option. The last question you'll see will be a multiple choice. Okay, so um, uh, what else? Let's see. Okay, cool. So uh, this webinar is being recorded and uh, we're going to make sure after the presentation is over that we upload it to our member website and provide a link. If you don't uh, see where to find it on the member website, uh, a link will be included in our upcoming Members Edge newsletter. So as long as you are looking through those articles, you should see one in there with a link to the um, remote and security don't panic webinar from today. Um, just moving ahead one slide, I'd like to talk a little bit about today's speakers. Uh, obviously, I'm here from San Francisco Association of Realtors and Rob Schenk and Kyle Ramirez are here from Intivix. 
Uh, Intivix has been a trusted partner of ours for, uh, for many years now, uh, going on seven years. Uh, Rob Shank is the founder of Intivix. Uh, we've been, as I say, working with him for a while now. They are a full service IT partner. They have enabled us to do some incredible things, uh, most notably to transition our entire office, to transform it from being all on premises to being completely remote distributed with little to no interruption in services to our members. Um, they help you figure out right-sized services and solutions that fit you, um, and they've been, they've been fantastic. Uh, Kyle is a systems engineer with Intivix, works with Rob. Kyle, would you mind telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Kyle Ramirez. I'm a systems engineer with Intivix, and that's kind of just tech speak for the guy who goes in there, learns exactly what every, how everything is working today, and provides some conveniences through technology just to make things easier. I'm a third generation San Francisco native, and it's probably my upbringing within the communities around me that has shaped me at my core. Cool. I, I truly enjoy helping others, sharing my gifts of understanding technology and problem solving to provide solutions and education to anyone who can benefit. And a lot of my IT philosophy revolves around reversing that stigma that IT requires you to change how you get things done. And instead, let's make technology work for you, like digital assistance instead of a digital burden. Well, that's a phenomenal way to wrap that up, Kyle, because one of the things you've helped us do is um, transition our existing processes to uh, working collaboratively and working remotely. And we did it with very little, oh my God, we have to totally you know, decompose or, or deconstruct what we're doing and put it back together in an entirely new way. So that's, that's really um, on topic. Um, today's agenda is going to cover a few things. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the SFAR and Intivix partnership story, just um, to sort of go over how things started uh, for us as an organization. We will also talk about technologies and strategies for maintaining productivity. Um, then we'll talk about protection and security and data security. And finally, some helpful guidance and tips for working from home. Um, and before we get into the actual content, why don't we start off with one of those polls? Should we do that? Let's do that, Jay, and thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, go ahead and kick off the poll, folks, and this is Rob speaking here. I will go ahead and kick that off. You should see it uh, momentarily. You guys should be able to start responding now. Okay, I see it, yeah. So hopefully everyone else does too. Yeah, starting to get some responses in here. Very cool. I like one of these options that's in the list here, Rob, my, in my nephew is a computer whiz. I think one of the common things that emerged in the last decade or so was, um, you know, someone in someone's family would attend ComSci or any kind of an IT course, and they would sort of just become de facto tech support for their entire, uh, sometimes family, sometimes people that they, you know, that their parents work with or that they work with. Um, I wonder, I wonder how much that's still prevalent today. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it depends on the size of the organization, uh, where they're at. Uh, but it looks like so far we don't have many of those. So let's, as far as the results go, we got about 77% uh, with folks internal to the organization. Uh, about 20% have some gaps. And uh, looks like one uses a third-party provider currently. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. So hopefully for those people that know that they've got some gaps, um, we can provide some information for them. And for those of you that have someone internal to your organization, um, they might still be looking for you to help them understand uh, what gaps exist so that they can improve what services they're delivering to you. So I think there's still some great content here for, for those people. Okay. Uh, so moving ahead one slide. Um, the story between SFAR and Intivix starts about uh, seven or eight years ago when I first came to San Francisco. We had a lot of uh, services running inside the building. We had a lot of um, things that were what we call on-premises. And we slowly, over the last couple of years, analyzed um, what were those things, how many of these things could be put into the cloud, how many couldn't. And uh, we broke down everything into a list of what services were critical, what services were just sort of nice to have, or things we could sort of live without. Uh, we found out that almost everything we did was critical, unfortunately, which meant we need to look, needed to look at doing better backups. We needed to uh, determine better ways of protecting the information so that if the building burned down, for example, we had uh, business continuity. And then finally, we had to look at business uh, communication for the team. And at first, there was no need to figure out 
uh, you know, remote communication. But about two years ago, um, I started working remotely for SFAR a lot of the time. And so uh, Intivix was my partner for figuring out how could I work remotely and be just as effective as I was when I was working in the building. And so uh, we started a project um, to make all the services available via remote. Uh, this ended up being great uh, because as we got closer to uh, the realization that all of our office would be needing to work remotely for a little while, we were able to transition swiftly and uh, make sure that all the employees were able to communicate with one another and uh, make sure that business continuity was not interrupted. And we did that successfully with Intivix's help in less than two days. Uh, so thank you guys very much for being hyper available during that very stressful couple of days. Yeah, I think that was one of those situations where you kind of just got to, you got to respond. And I think the, um, the ground that was laid kind of really accelerated that process and made that a lot, a lot easier uh, once the, everything kind of came down a few weeks back. Um, but uh, I think it's, I think you're just laying that foundation uh, is critical for businesses these days. Um, and then I think the other part of it too is, um, you know, the type of tools that we deployed for you guys uh, have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, real time kind of communication options in there that allow the team to even in a remote manner, be able to communicate seamlessly. And I think openness to those openness to that change has been also very critical from a kind of cultural point of view as well. And the organization had some resistance um, over the last couple of years of transitioning from email, which was and is still our primary communications tool to something with a little more immediacy. But boy, was everyone happy that they were at least um, exposed to those tools so that they didn't have to learn them from scratch on day zero. Uh, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about what those tools were that we deployed. Yeah, so uh, this is Kyle again. And there's a lot of available tools to each organization. And it's more about knowing what those tools do and how they can fit into your organization the way that you already work. Uh, when I talk about not wanting to change the way you work, it's about picking the platform that enables you to work best and uh, not trying to put you know a square peg into a round hole. So I've arranged these in kind of different verticals. You have some all-in-one solutions at the top there, Office 365, G Suite from Google, or you might have an existing Windows Server infrastructure, some you know existing foundations that you want to make available from anywhere, whenever. Uh, or you're just looking for communications platforms. Uh, so Microsoft Teams is an offering from Office 365 that allows for real-time collaboration and communication. It's got video chats and regular text chats, kind of instant messaging capabilities while also allowing you to edit files within the application. Or, you know, you're a Google Suite customer and you're using Google Hangouts, Google Chat, and you're looking for kind of an evolution of this communications hub. Slack is a great alternative to some of the Microsoft offerings if you're not already a Microsoft customer. So Slack is similar, if you've heard of it, it's that communications hub that allows teams to work together in their own kind of chat rooms, channels, and allows for some focus on various initiatives or various teamwork items. And these communication hubs also have the ability to use plugins to other systems. So if you have uh, some sort of project management software like Asana or Trello, most of these communication softwares allow you to integrate with those to have a one place area for your team to collaborate and communicate. And I mentioned uh, what if you have some existing infrastructure in the office and it's difficult to access at the moment? Uh, I've added an item here in the communications bar called 8x8. They're a VoIP provider that's voice over internet and they allow uh, mobile app communications. This allows you to keep your business communications over a trusted channel and uh, it's a very flexible solution where you can have business lines maybe ported over from traditional providers like AT&T and you can port them over to a more flexible platform that allows you to access your business line in the field without paying for an additional device. You know, uh, you don't have to carry two phones, one business and one personal. You can just have a business app on your personal phone that allows you access to your trusted business line. Kyle, let's stop there for one second. Uh, one of the things I've seen some people ask me about uh, recently is they'll say things like, what about free voice over IP services like Viber or other communications tools um, that they're already using for social media? 
Um, I've always advised people to be careful about using their social media tools that might be personal social media tools for doing business communications. Um, what would Intivix's guidance on that be? You know, from my standpoint, you do want to have kind of a line in the sand and some level of distinction. I think this helps you stay focused. You know, um, if I get if I give out my personal number to all my business contacts, which is fine. You know, if you have to do that, you have to do that. Um, that kind of requires me to answer every single phone call as if it were a prospective client. Um, you know, my mom might be calling from a new number and then I answer the phone like I've never talked to her before, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so there, there are some benefits of segregating these, these kind of communications channels, but also, um, you know, this, this allows you some freedom of expression within your personal life that doesn't allow those uh, expressions to spill over into your business image. So I think that separating them has a lot of values where also I want to talk on that kind of free platform idea. Um, you you kind of want to be cognizant of where your communications are going and uh, maybe, you know, what companies are accessing them. So, you know, you mentioned Viber, there's like WhatsApp, there's a lot of different uh, methods of accessing communication to your clients. But I think choosing a professional product also helps you to identify your business with a professional channel and right. your clients will notice. Yeah, I'd also like to add just from a kind of security point of view as well, <clears throat> especially if you're uh, managing multiple folks, uh, having one common platform that has some kind of security stack built into it is also really helpful from a kind of governance point of view. And uh, like Kyle says, kind of, you know, kind of elevates the overall kind of communications uh, strategy and kind of creates you know, kind of clear kind of demarcation lines uh, between business and personal. Those are smart recommendations. And I didn't mean to, to prevent you from finishing the slide, Kyle. I know we were going to look at file sharing and virtual meetings. So maybe I'll, I'll let you finish. Yeah, these are, um, you know, elevations on what you might be doing today. So instead of, you know, maybe a decade ago, you were paying a bicycle courier to run files off to a client just to get them signed and run them back. Uh, you can, there are, We'll talk on this later, but there are electronic signature solutions. Um, but for file sharing, say I need to collaborate with an outside entity, or uh, I have a bunch of you know building plans that I want to be able to share with uh, kind of a vendor or a prospective client. That is going to you're going to be able to enable this digitally through a product called OneDrive. That's going to be if you're a Microsoft Cloud customer or you're pursuing the idea of solution of being a Microsoft Cloud customer. If you are looking for a third party service or maybe you use uh, the Google suite, you have Google Drive available to you. You could use a product like Dropbox. And again, this is just enabling you to share your data securely uh, on a platform where you're able to kind of define what those security controls are. And if you have an existing server and you want to be able to share files out, there's a product called My Work Drive that securely allows you to share out with specific individuals or within your organization the ability to access your company files where they typically may have been only accessible from the office. Yeah, my work drive has been a really important part of our solution at the association um, for the members on the phone. I mean, we keep detailed records on all of our membership, but it doesn't make sense for us to push, um, you know, the terabytes of that information up into a, a cloud service. A lot of that information is only relevant as a historical record that we're keeping. Uh, about our membership, about listing data. So we have a huge volume of internal data that it, it doesn't make sense to put in Dropbox. Uh, so we're using my work drive to enable remote office employees to still be able to see that internal to the office uh, data volume without compromising security. We're not having people email a bunch of files back and forth. We're not um, you know, using insecure technologies for file sharing. My work drive lets us maintain good security and also let all the staff access the files from the data drive that they need to get to every day. Yeah, and I want to touch on uh, virtual meetings next. So this is probably the area where you're going to get the biggest value if you can adopt this as soon as possible. If you're not, if you don't already have a channel to access clients, prospective clients, uh, vendors through some sort of virtual meeting presence, you know, you've got video call where you can can see one another and really gauge each other's attention. Um, you, you really should be looking into these options because they can really provide inroads to different business uh, sources, but also, you know, you are kind of making yourself a differentiator in your space where if your competition's not offering this, 
you are and if your competition is offering this if you're not you know that that will differentiate you in a negative way right. and can we talk about zoom a little bit i know there's been some press yeah. lately on this and I'm, we're using zoom today so maybe yeah if you wouldn't mind commenting yeah no some of you uh it may not be lost on some of you that zoom has been having some recent scrutiny in the news and we're using it now so zoom is a user-friendly platform to reach large audiences uh, but there are concerns around the content of meetings and calls being accessed by individuals you wouldn't want dropping in. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed by the speed at which Zoom was able to respond to these callouts with their own security updates, but your usage of any platform really goes back to awareness. If you have existing trusted channels, you know, prioritize those. If Zoom is the right fit for your organization, continue to be aware of what those risks are and just adapt your usage to be cognizant of those risks. So, you know, you want to, if you're having a confidential conversation, maybe you want to have that over a confidential trusted line. Um, maybe that's not the right place to use Zoom. And what are the alternatives? So if you're an Office 365 customer, you can use Teams, Microsoft Teams, and they've implemented a new feature that competes with the ease of use and reach of Zoom called Teams Live Events. If you're not an Office 365 customer, you can check out something like GoToMeeting. It's one of the largest market shareholders in the virtual meeting space. Yeah, and GoToMeeting's been uh, really useful for us at the association. It's less sexy, but it's um, it's really rock solid. And for us, it's it's been a secure channel. Maybe for those that are using Zoom currently, maybe some best practices that we might uh, suggest. Um, you know, you can enable passwords for meetings currently. Uh, they have a new feature where you can go ahead and enable a waiting room. So basically, they're going to be kind of in a waiting room until the host goes ahead and allows them. And, you know, definitely looking into alternatives like, uh, you know, Microsoft Teams or GoToMeeting for any kind of sensitive or confidential type of meetings as well. Cool. Yeah. So let's talk about ways that companies enable remote access currently. So if you are uh, connecting to your office currently, a lot of offices are using uh, something called virtual private networks or VPNs to connect from the remote laptop, remote machine to the office. And this creates a, uh, a secure channel between the two devices or the, the network and the laptop you're connecting from. Now, once you're connected, you're able to access company files, applications, and related services. Now, the one caveat to mention for folks that are using uh, the one thing we want to get out there is strongly do not recommend. If you're using a home machine and you happen to stick VPN software on it to connect to your office, that is going to create a lot of security risk for you currently. Typically, most home PCs are not very secure. Uh, and if a hacker is able to get into that home machine and then you connect to the office over a VPN connection, at that point, the hacker has a secure line right into the company network. And at that point, you can get a ransomware infection across your network uh, or get some other sort of uh, hacking incident occur, which we all want to avoid. Now, in order to uh, kind of circumvent those kinds of things, one would be either if you're going to use VPN, make sure that you're using it from a trusted work machine or work laptop um, versus a home machine. Uh, or you look into some other kind of remote, remote access type solutions. Uh, we mentioned my work drive a bit earlier. That also provides that secure conduit into the network. Or looking into tools like Log Me In or Go To My PC, where in that case, you're basically connecting to a machine that's at the office and you're essentially remote controlling that machine. Uh, and then you're just acting as if you're sitting right in front of it. Um, so maybe Kai, you want to talk about maybe some ways, things that uh, folks will want to avoid with regards to remote access. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, in today's challenging times, you uh, are likely being advertised all of these different services that are available to you today. And the easiest ones to get into are just the ones that are free, right? But when, you know, there's that kind of that new adage about if the product is free, then you're the actual product. So do you really want the data that you're sending over these free products to be sold to who knows who? Uh, there's free Wi-Fi, which is uh, free for you to connect to, but also free for the hackers to connect to. And perhaps the free Wi-Fi, because it's being made available to a wide area, 
uh, is also maybe less secure. And that's not, you know, always a hard and fast rule. Um, but it's something about, you know, goes back to awareness. Just be aware of what you're using and the environments you're using. So there are protections to be able to join free Wi-Fi, but there's also alternatives where you could have a personal hotspot on your smartphone that allows you to enable um, mobile access in the field. There are free um, products that emulate the log me in and go to my PC services. So those are products that allow you to remotely control your office PC from anywhere. Uh, there are products called Chrome Remote Desktop, Team Viewer, and again, they work, but at what cost, right? So it's free to you, but you know how there's no agreement there. There's no kind of terms of service that allow you to control the data that's being streamed through these. And uh, you know, when you're accessing these things from personal devices on a free network with a free service, there's just a lot of variables there that are out of your control. So it kind of goes back to awareness and being able to control the communications that are happening between your devices and your company. Awesome. Why don't we um, take a poll and see what people have been doing so far with uh, remote access? Uh, maybe let's, yeah, let's throw it up, Rob. Yeah, just kick that off. And there uh, should be two questions in this one. Yes, there is. Yeah, so public Wi-Fi, you know, uh, Starbucks, they, any of those Wi-Fi's where you can join without a password, that's going to be considered public Wi-Fi. There are some networks as well, uh, Xfinity Wi-Fi. You know, you might be an Xfinity customer in the Bay Area and joining some of these uh, open hotspots where you have to log in with your Comcast or Xfinity credentials. But again, it's free for you. Um, but you know, how do you know what Comcast or Xfinity is doing with the data that you're streaming over that service? Uh, you, you don't. So that's just one of those things that you want to be aware of. All right. So we're cut some interesting results here. So uh, do you use public Wi-Fi? Right now, that's about a third say yes, about 60% no, and about 10% are using a VPN. That's great to hear. And yeah. this is a VPN. This is different than the VPN we were just talking about a moment ago about connecting to my office. What kind of VPN is this? Uh, so you can actually, there's various tools that could be installed on either like on, on a mobile device mm -hmm. that basically will go ahead and encrypt the connections that you have if you're using a public Wi-Fi. So any sort of browsing work kind of related stuff that you're doing is going to go be kind of encrypted and secured. Um, so there's various uh, kind of VPN services that are available on, you know, iOS or Android stores uh, that you can go ahead and secure your mobile communications. Um, and uh, I think for one thing that's interesting, for the folks that are using public Wi-Fi, the 30% of you, uh, just a caution out there, uh, be very careful about doing any sort, any sort of information that's sensitive. If you're doing banking transactions and you're just connecting over to the latest Starbucks uh, Wi-Fi connection and you're doing that sort of stuff, you have they run a, a serious risk of getting that uh, your password stolen and things like that. So be very careful with that. Uh, any sort of sensitive stuff be doing from behind a protected network if, if at all possible. Um, we're looking at, uh, do you have hotspot features on your phone? Uh, looks like about 30% are using that a lot. 40% uh, uh, know about it, but don't use it. And looks like about uh, about 30% don't use it or try and stay away from it. Interesting. I'm glad to see uh, a few people using it quite a bit. Um, I'm always, uh, when I'm in an airport, I travel quite a bit, or I used to. Um, and I find airport Wi-Fi so convenient. But I always think to myself, geez, if, if, I'm, if I need to log into the bank and do some banking, I disconnect from public Wi-Fi because I'm no longer just browsing news. Now I'm, I'm doing some real work. So then I'll connect through my phone uh, just to make sure that I'm on a secure channel because I control my phone. So Yeah, so one question came in. Uh, why might I meant, you would, might want to mention if someone is using public Wi-Fi, how do they remove it? Mm, that's a great thing. So on Windows and Mac computers, if you're using your laptop, there's um, in your network config settings, you can actually forget previous networks. And if you want to stay disconnected from that, there are settings in both Windows and uh, Mac OS for saying don't connect to open, free open hotspots. That's something that's in your settings configuration. Uh, Rob, would you add anything to that? Uh, yeah, let's just say we ideally speaking, you want to have control over the networks that you connect to. So if there's ones that are automatically connecting, you definitely ideally would want to disable that. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, we'll post some maybe a link or two that uh, at the end of this 
uh, to go ahead and uh, send that out to folks uh, if they have any questions about that. But ideally, question. yeah, but ideally speaking, you want to control what you connect to and you want to make that decision rather than the system just kind of making that decision on your behalf and then you're connected and you're not really sure who you're connected to or why and run the, the security risks that we were talking about earlier. Right. Great. So, you know, I want to talk about this term that you might be hearing uh, more and more each week, but there's this idea of digital transformation. So traditional businesses adopting technology and having that kind of evolve their business and really expand the growth of their business. And I don't know if any of you out there kind of feel this pressure, but, uh, you know, I liken technology to this train. Like it's just always moving. It's like going at the same speed, but it's just, it never stops, right? Um, do you kind of want to be at the front of that train or do you want to be stuck in the caboose, like chasing after it like a cartoon character? Um, technology really is just opening doors for organizations, the providing more opportunities to grow and expand. Clients today, your prospective clients or existing clients, they're expecting speedy and magical solutions that technology can provide. And the most successful businesses are the ones adapting to these expectations. For some, this is you know, live video walkthroughs of properties, you know, electronic signature tools that allow delivery of agreements, connecting clients with trusted appraisers and inspectors via video calls. But for clients that you can't meet face-to-face -face with, what can you do to ensure that you're not on the receiving end of a bad deal? How do you know that a potential client isn't actually a hacker trying to capture your password and access your contacts list to continue that rampage of destruction? This is all solved through awareness. Learn the signs of what these attempts look like. Learn how to identify the most common types of attacks. You know, what does email spoofing, uh, what does email phishing attempts look like? I think this is something that uh, Jay can really speak to. Uh, he's been able to be vigilant and kind of capture these things and enable all of his you know, organization members to do the same. Yeah, in fact, we had uh, an incident about geez, four years ago now in 2016 and um, we had, this was our first major, what we considered an email or security breach at the association. And it really had nothing to do with the association. We weren't hacked. What happened was uh, someone who was receiving confidential email from us, they were hacked. And so what someone was able to do was get a mostly complete list of all of our agents, just their email addresses, but still a mostly complete list of thousands of, of agents. And they uh, downloaded email from the person's compromised computer that looked like something we had sent. And they replicated the look and feel of it. Okay. But they made a bunch of mistakes. And this is pretty common, what you see in um, these, these phishing emails uh, where they're trying to get you to click on a link. So I'm just going to walk through this example from 2016 and give you some highlights, things you can just look for that help you identify something that's not real. So spelling errors are usually very common inside um, a spoofed email. You can see that they spelt San Francisco Realtor. They, they didn't spell everything correctly. They didn't capitalize things correctly the way we would at the association. They didn't use the agent's actual name. So it just says, dear member. Um, and then the link here, check out that PDF link. So when I hovered over the email uh, with my mouse, it showed me a link in my browser that said where this link was gonna go. And most browsers and email software today support this feature, where if you hover over a link, it will briefly show you where it's going to go before you go there. And of course, waldorftrust.com, some zip file, this is not a PDF. This is gonna get you to download a file and unzip malicious software that will then try to take over your computer or um, do something nefarious. So um, we were able to react quickly and get messaging out to our members to be aware that this was happening. Uh, and then internally for our staff, we started a security program uh, where we were teaching our staff members how to be really vigilant and how to spot these things and how common scams work. And maybe you guys could talk about that program that you've got a little bit. Yeah, I think that's, you know, security awareness training has been one of the kind of staples of improving or increasing the level of security awareness across teams. Um, so it's one of those things where, you know, the uh, typical end user is kind of the front line 
and having the awareness of the ways that hackers are trying to trick you. So a lot of social engineering types of things where they're, they're trying to trick you even over the phone now. Um, a lot of different, you know, hackers are very creative in the ways that they try to attack and uh, target folks. And having a base level of awareness of the common strategies and common tactics that they use is really helpful for those frontline folks that are getting uh, a lot of these kinds of attacks being sent their way. And so that's been very helpful, I think, from, uh, you know, from our client's point of view, as far as, you know, just increasing that level of awareness to reduce these level, uh, this level of risk and attack that's pretty common these days. And even with the, you know, the COVID-19, there's a lot of scams that hackers are taking advantage of there. So this oh. is not, yeah, so this, it just kind of accelerates. What is the, you know, order of the day and their hackers are going towards uh, where that, where that, uh, you know, those, those eyeballs are. So there's folks, you know, just got to be aware and uh, you know, vigilance. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we're inundated with email, we're inundated with you know, activity in life. And it's, it's very common, very easy to kind of, you know, inadvertently click on something you didn't mean to because you're kind of rushing through something. So being able to kind of take that step back and pause before you click uh, is one of those things that's always helpful to do. But it does yeah, I'd like happen. to add, um, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Kyle, I'll just jump in for a sec. Um, if something does happen, I mean, I think the, what did we have before on the poll for people who have an internal resource? There was quite a few people said they have an, a resource, right? Mm -hmm. So if you do accidentally click on something and it appears to take you to a malicious website, and even if you're not sure, immediately reach out to your internal um, technical resource to inform them that this is a possible breach so they can help you right away. The sooner you intervene, intervene uh, the more uh, effective the response can be and the, the damage can be minimized or even, uh, you know, nullified if you react fast enough. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Kyle. Oh, no, not at all. I, you know, I just wanted to highlight how, you know, the, the kind of hacking landscape has really changed over the last decade if you remember like that movie from the 80s hackers it's about like kids punks you know who like are hacking away at their computer and, and kind of up to no good but this this landscape has really changed to more organized crime you know these cyber security threats are um it's just organized op crimes of opportunity they're glomming on to different opportunities like these COVID 19 fears and kind of latching onto that but they might also be uh, attacking you at your own opportunities. So impersonating a prospective client, you know, this really highlights that if it's too good to be true, like really pay attention and, and give some more scrutiny. So, um, you know, all types of opportunities are, are crimes of opportunity for these organized crime organizations to just get in and steal your information, sell it to the highest bidder, or, you know, sell access to all of your devices. So what can we do about this? Is there, is there anything we can do proactively? Yeah, so if you're looking to kind of enhance that security posture of your business, which let's face it, is something you can just throw around to market yourself, uh, you could try some or all of these initiatives that I've kind of laid out here. You really should consider extending protections to all devices that access your organization's data. So I'm a Mac user at home through and through, just Apple everything, phone, computer, TV, watch, uh, I've been drinking that Apple Kool-Aid for years. And then you don't need antivirus, do you? No. So, you know, you're not alone. More and more households have adopted Apple devices, but hackers worldwide have noticed that growth. And so that common misconception that Macs don't need antivirus, uh, is just not true. You know, yeah. security protections are more than just protection and prevention from downloading viruses. Uh, on your Mac today, you could download and install antivirus to protect you from at that level, at the file level, but also consider using an ad blocker. Ad blockers are free uh, for within your web browser that can prevent 95% of those malicious pop-ups across the internet. There's products that I use personally, uh, uBlock Origin or Nano Ad Blocker. I'll post those names in the chat shortly. Uh, I use those as trusted plugins to kind of block the ads that help me maintain my focus online but also prevent a lot of those like call 1-800, your computer's locked and I'm pretending to be a hacker, you know, so that I can get you to call me and give me your money. Right. Um, there's scams and there's malicious attempts. There's just a wide array of, uh, you know, negative things on the internet that you should be aware of and protected from. And so coming back to that awareness, uh, I do want to highlight that security awareness training programs 
Organizations have provided these to employees that keeps everyone up to date on what to look out for. This isn't like a one-time learn what it looks like and then kind of uh, forget to pay attention to it. There's a continued vigilance of knowing what the latest scam is, knowing what the latest you know, hack is, so that you can be sure that you're always up to date. Because if you're not up to date on your awareness, you're just introducing more opportunities for those crimes of opportunity to get into your organization. Right. So uh, how many different devices do you guys use to conduct business? Did you attach your business email to your iPad last year and forget about it? You know, where is that iPad now? Is that the one that you gave away to a family member who's stuck self-isolating at home? Uh, you know, where is your email? Where, you know, where have you attached it to all these different devices? And do you have some reasonable level of um, you know, confidence that your data is protected no matter where it's accessed? Actually, one thing that we see often is um, on, on public terminals. So we've got uh, a few courtesy terminals that exist at the association for members who, you know, would traditionally have come in um, on foot to either maybe get lockbox service or something else. And so we provided two computers there. And um, it was surprising how many times people would get busy, they'd take a phone call, they would walk away. And a uh, half hour later, we would see that their email client was still logged in and they've left the building. Uh, so whenever you're using any kind of a public terminal, it, you really must um, be really sure that you log out of everything completely before you walk away from that terminal. They're provided for courtesy and you can use them uh, if they're in an environment where you're reasonably certain that they'll be secure, like the association, for example, the MLS staff would you know, go over and, and log people out. But, but always make sure you log yourself out of any terminal that you use that you don't directly control or own or cannot take with you. Yeah, yeah also, that's a great I, highlight. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that too. Probably the single most number one thing that I think folks can do to protect themselves is to enable two-factor authentication. Uh, so this is basically something you know, which is your password and something you have, which is maybe your phone uh, or a laptop device. And so they, you typically see this for, you remember the kind of the banks would have these kind of RSA tokens where they would have a little device and every minute a little code would change kind of same idea of that, but we're doing that with your mobile phones now. That reduces these email phishing attacks that we've been talking about by like 95%. Um, that's kind of now if any, if you're accessing your banks or any sort of financial data, absolutely need to make sure that you're enabling that across the board. And I would say across your entire company for all your various critical applications and services that you use, that would be kind of probably the number one suggestion that we'd have to help lower the overall risk uh, for anybody uh, listening today. Yeah, there's some level of personal responsibility here too, right? So uh, this isn't something that a trusted technology partner can just do for you. There is some level of self-action where, uh, you know, you need to be aware of these things and kind of maybe change your behaviors to be more secure and, you know, be more proactive in protecting your own access from things. You know, the, the police doesn't come by and lock your front door for you. You walk out of the house and you lock the door behind you. It's kind of the same thing. Um, there's a bit of personal responsibility around all of this. Oh, we had a good question that just came in, Kyle. Uh, do you think facial recognition is safe? That's interesting. Um, that's a good point where, in a much larger discussion about, um, you know, where is your data going, right? So there are services or there, there are like consumer products that are social media products like Snapchat, um, you know, Instagram that provide these things called filters and they might, you know, make you look funny, put on like some fake makeup. Uh, they might put on like a clown face for you or allow you to wear like a digital mask. Um, but these are actually uh, data capturing points for these companies to take your facial recognition data and store them into a database. And so this goes back to that, like, if it's free, do you really know where your data is going? And I think at some level, you probably shouldn't take it personally. Um, they're not relating like, oh, this is the face that belongs to this person and like these, you know, this is exactly who they are. So it's not really identifying you, but it is more just awareness about like where your data is going and how it's being used. And I think the question of like, is it safe? Um, I really think that can't be answered without knowing, without the awareness of knowing where this information is going and how it's being used. And most companies just are not sharing those kinds of intentions with their users. Maybe we can talk about 
the next level, which is passwords. You know, that's something that, you know, the traditional conventional wisdom has been, hey, you want to have like, you know, eight characters, maybe some spe you know, letters, numbers, combination of some special characters, and I'm safe. You know, that, and then being able to remember all these passwords just becomes a kind of an ordeal for many people. And oftentimes this leads to behaviors where folks are using the same password in multiple logins, multiple services, multiple applications. And eventually one of those accounts gets hacked and then all of a sudden hackers are leveraging that same password that they just have garnered here. And they try it across all uh, person's other sites and services that they use. And lo and behold, they're getting hacked. So uh, what's the traditional, what's the, what's the, what's the next uh, wave of, what's the recommendations now, Kyle, for with regards to pa safe password length and that sort of thing? Yeah, and before we move on to that, I do uh, kind of want to ask, you know, we have a poll question here about asking the audience about their antivirus usage. So yeah. we, let's kind of continue with the device and then we can also definitely go on to this uh, passphrase kind of discussion. So I have a cheeky kind of slide here, you know, antivirus is more than a face mask. It's more than just, uh, you know, hand sanitizer. But do you have antivirus on the computer that you use every day for business? And this might be a personal device that accesses, you know, company data. This might be a specific device that's owned by the company or kind of specifically designed only to be used for business work. Um, but go ahead and answer in the poll here to see, um, you know, kind of what the antivirus usage is amongst everybody in the, in the webinar today. Uh, pretty interesting results so far, but it looks like two thirds yes, one third no. That's phenomenal to see it be two thirds. There was a time when it would have been less than half. So that's really encouraging. So yeah, going back to this uh, passphrase kind of conversation. Um, you know, I call this like securing your home office. It's like, you know, make sure your fortress of solitude is actually a fortress. So uh, do you have this strong login passphrase? If you lose your device or it's stolen from you out of like the trunk of your car or a smash and grab here in the Bay Area, um, can you have some reasonable level of confidence that your device can't be breached because the password is nice and complex? So in the past, yeah, Rob had mentioned uh, we had passwords, which were like maybe one word and like a number and an exclamation point, right? Or it was like my date of birth and like my mom's name and an exclamation point or a dollar sign. Password Those, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which, you know, can, you know, we've seen out there in the wild. I would say that those are, you know, not only kind of breakable and they're weak passwords because of, uh, you know, how simple they are. It's more about how short they are. And so, how do you make some longer password, which is much more difficult to break uh, without making it difficult to remember? So that's kind of where this phrase or this uh, yeah, phrase was coined called pass phrases. You pick something that is meaningful to you. Uh, Jay has some tips here also, but um, you know, pick something that, that you can understand, that you can remember, something that maybe is already in your mind that you haven't already forgotten. Uh, yeah, Jay, did you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. My strategy, uh, because I'm a really big music guy, um, is I, you know, I sing the lyrics to a lot of songs that I love when I'm, you know, in the car alone. So uh, I know my lyrics from my songs, like the back of my hand. I can pick some obscure lyric from a song that no one would even know I knew. Um, and I know that lyric and I'll never forget it. So I'm able to use it. And uh, if I just insert a colon in the middle or a period, or sometimes the lyric itself has an exclamation point in it, if it's a declaration, it's really easy to remember. Um, uh, some friends of mine are really big into um, literature. And what they do is they love certain phrases from novels that they read. They love that. And so they'll, they'll pick a part of a sentence. And just those three or four words together are unique enough and long enough that it's an easy to type password. It's maybe 13 characters or 16, um, but it's long and it's secure and they can, uh, you know, have a reasonable certainty of never forgetting it. So what's the best practice here? Uh, try to shoot for, like Jay mentioned, this like above 15 character limit. Um, you know, there are technical papers that we could bore you with, but uh, above 15 characters really reduce, it's kind of a line in the sand where specific kind of encryption methods are, are not able to break through that level of passwording. So that's a great number, more than 15 characters. You can get to that easily with three to four words. And you know, that's great. You know, I've got a long passphrase that I can remember and I should use it everywhere for all of my banking sites, right? You know, cause I, you know, how am I gonna remember 15 different phrases? Rob, Whoa, how, how would I do that? Whoa, hang on, right? 
Yeah, well, that's what a password manager is going to help you with. A password manager will manage all of these passwords for you on your behalf. And oftentimes, you know, there's a, uh, an extension that you can install in your browser. And so when you're going to these various sites, it'll go ahead and just pop in your username and your password, and it keeps track of all these various passwords for you. So you don't have to remember these per se. Your password manager can go ahead and, and manage that on your behalf. It's much more secure. Uh, some of these services even will go ahead and cycle through these passwords on a regular basis on your behalf. So you can go ahead and, and uh, increase the security over time. But definitely look into password managers as a way to you know, get away from having to remember these you know, tons and tons of passwords that we're all kind of burdened with it these, these days. Yeah, and, and if, if you'd really... Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, if you really like a Fort Knox kind of protection against these different areas that you have these passphrases, I want to reiterate this multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication, where even if your 100-character password gets out there, maybe you accidentally you know, pasted it into a document that you put on Facebook, um, if that password gets out there and somebody tries to use it and you have this multi-factor authentication, which most services like iCloud, all these different services are offering this, um, you're going to get a notification on your phone that says, you know, your password was just entered. Do you want to allow access? Yes or no. And you're gonna know pretty quickly, like, no, I was not trying to log into my bank right now. I'm actually in the middle of a meeting. You can just hit no uh, or not respond to it. And you know that access will not be granted to whoever has your leaked password. Wow, that's so important that I think it's worth restating. Wherever you can go to turn on two-factor authentication in your Google accounts, um, a lot of the banks support it now. Uh, anything that supports it, your, um, <clears throat> your iCloud account at Apple, Go and turn on two-factor authentication. It absolutely is uh, a massive improvement over even having a relatively strong password. So uh, 2FA or MFA is where it's at. Yep. Well, and I wanna thank everybody for uh, letting us talk about security with you all because it's definitely something that we could talk about forever. Um, but I wanna talk more about that home office experience. So, you know, we're all working from home. You're probably at home right now watching this webinar, joining us today. And uh, what are some improvements you can make to your space that are going to kind of enhance the professionalism of your appearance uh, and then, you know, the quality of your work. So if you have the ability, try to carve out a quiet space to work out of. This has the benefit of allowing you to focus and minimize distractions to yourself and anyone else that you have on a call. If your only option is a shared space, invest in a headset. You're gonna sound more clear to your clients and you'll be able to hear everything that they have to say. Um, again, that shared space, there are uh, headsets that have both ears on them that really allows you to maintain focus. Um, but if you are constantly on and off the phone, you can have a one-sided headset as well. Run a test call and look at your background. So uh, if this is kind of your first adoption of video calling, you should really, these are some tips and tricks that are just gonna make sure that you have a good experience. So you wanna run a test call, make sure your hardware is working, but look at your background. So sometimes you can't stop pets from just like running through the house, but maybe consider, you know, like moving that pile of laundry to the laundry room before a call with a potential client. You wanna dress for success as well. So there's a clinical study that shows you'll be more productive when you dress the part. Medical professionals in the lab were asked to perform their lab tests in street clothes and a separate group was asked to perform the same lab tests wearing lab coats. And can you guess whose work had just had less errors? Which group got their done, work done more efficiently? It's the effort to prepare yourself for each day, regardless of who's watching, that acts as a foundation for your daily success. And this kind of segues into camera placement. So find some old Amazon boxes or something to prop up your laptop. Try to keep your camera at eye level or slightly above, but never below. So appearance is everything. Don't let your webcam position just do you this disservice. You wanna look as great as you do in your professional headshots. Uh, one question just came in. Can you have virtual background while working from home? Yeah, so um, different services allow different features here. So um, Zoom allows you to kind of pick a photo that will act as your virtual background, but there is, um, you know, it doesn't always work depending on the quality of your webcam. Sometimes it makes you look like this garbled mess and it's more trouble than it's worth. 
Microsoft Teams is a different platform, and um, I've used a lower quality webcam with this feature to blur your, your background. And I thought that was really cool where um, somehow it just is able to make sure that you're always in focus, but the things around you have this like privacy blur on it. Uh, so that even if there are distractions in the background that you can't avoid, uh, these things are just going to be out of focus and they're not going to catch the attention of your you know, potential client or existing client. Because that's really the last thing you want, right? You're trying to convey some important information that you really want them to internalize. And instead, they're like watching, you know, your kids play in the background, something that you can't avoid. And this goes it back into that just the communication, this last point. So uh, it can be difficult to adjust to video calls. Sometimes you lose the nonverbal cues that you would pick up on naturally when you're conversing in person, but you can be just as charming online as you are in person, but maybe it takes a bit of practice. Uh, speak clearly, don't forget to smile, and uh, you know, you're gonna have a great experience online virtually the same as you would in person. Just, you, know, you wanna land those clients no matter where you are. One practical tip I have about your workspace, uh, learn from my mistake, but uh, create a no spill zone. So if you are working out of a home office, you've got a keyboard and a mouse or your laptop, you know, create a designated space that your beverage is always at. You know, you've got your coffee, your water, what have you. Uh, you want to keep that away, almost opposite the other side of your keyboard and mouse. Last thing you want is to go to reach for your mouse and you knock over your key, you know, knock over your coffee. It's all over your laptop. And then now you've got to put on a mask and gloves to go to Best Buy and buy a new computer. Um, let's just kind of eliminate that whole experience and, and have a designated no spill zone. Cool. So we have a final poll question here. Uh, how have immediate shifts personally affected you? So we know a lot of you are working from home maybe for the first time. Some of you uh, had a schedule where you'd work from home a few days out of the week, but now you're almost required to stay home you know, every day of the week and, and continue to be just as productive and just as effective. And this one is multi-select. So check off all the ones that you think have um, impacted you. And then after this, we're gonna open it up for just open questions. All right, so let's see. Getting a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, that's understandable. Personal, personal motivation. And feelings of isolation seem to be the top three here. Home tech communication challenges are in the 10 to 15% range. And then about a third of folks are having attention divided between family and home and work. Yeah, I think one of the things to address the uncertainty is you could be introducing new tools into your organization that uh, differentiate you from your client, from your competitions. And this allows you to kind of focus on growing this new stream of revenue, um, you know, continuing your sales pipeline where maybe you were out in the field kind of you know, boots on the ground, you can still do the same work. So you can focus on those kinds of initiatives just from a different angle and using technology to help you enable that. Cool, Jay, a, a question came in. Um, as a new agent, how can I meet clients right now as open houses are not allowed? Yeah, we've had to take some steps inside the MLS system to let people reach out to their clients uh, using URLs, using, um, inviting them to join you on video chats. And normally we wouldn't have allowed those kinds of links to just be uh, added to the MLS, but those kinds of things are allowed now. Um, if you're actually just trying to meet clients for the first time, your business social media channels are gonna be your best way of trying to attract new eyes. Advertise that you are available for video chat. Advertise that uh, you are going to pick up the phone and then deliver. Uh, one of the things we noticed um, looking at NAR's data over the last five years before the pandemic was that most agents aren't very good at picking up the phone. When their phone rings, they're too busy. Uh, so they just let it go to voicemail. One of the best ways to meet new clients right now is to give them a sense that I will pick up the phone when you call and then do that. If you do that, you're already putting yourself in the top 15% of realtors in the country. And um, if you do that during this time under a crisis, people will have a sense that you're available. And right now, I think, uh, speaking to that feeling of isolation, people wanna know that someone's on the other end of the line that'll pick up. So I would advertise that you're available, and then if you can, truly be available for that client when they reach out to you for a first contact. 
Great. So if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to put them into the Q and A. And we'll give it another minute or two. And we'll see if any other questions come on in. Awesome. While that's wrapping up, I just want to thank Rob and Kyle for their uh, help at the organization. Um, you guys have been so valuable as a partner to us. I uh, just want to extend that as a sincere thanks. Um, I, at the association, we've enjoyed a great partnership with Intivix. If you do have a need for an internal partner, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend Rob and his team. Uh, you can see here there are some uh, contact links for reaching out to them. Maybe you've got some follow-up questions you'd like to ask privately. Um, you, can, you can try them on these channels. And um, again, many thanks to you guys for being, being there when we needed you. Yeah, and Jay, thank you so much for giving us this, uh, for working with, together with us on this uh, you know, presentation. I think hopefully it's been uh, of use for everyone and helpful and some helpful tips and tricks that everyone's learning here. Um, as we mentioned, we'll go ahead and make the recording available and we'll follow up with uh, the recording as well as answer a few of the questions that we had in the, uh, during the presentation and include that in the, in the follow-up email with everybody. Outstanding. All right, uh, looks like uh, no other questions at the moment. Uh, so maybe we wrap it up. That sounds good. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Kyle. All right, thanks, yeah, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care, Take everyone. Bye-bye.